everyone. I'm Danny Roddy of DannyRoddy.com, and today I'm talking with Georgie, aka Haydut, of RayPeteForum.com. Georgie is an independent health researcher and the owner of IdealabsDC.com, a small company producing high quality boutique supplements with the focus of supporting a healthy metabolism. Today, Georgie and I will discuss nitric oxide and methylene blue from a bioenergetic point of view, or the interaction between an organism and its environment, and how those changes influence cellular respiration. In addition to thanking Georgie for talking with me today, I'd like to thank my patrons for making this show and all the content I produce possible. If you'd like to become a patron, you can go to patreon.com slash Danny Roddy. Without further ado, here's the show. You know what? I thought we'd start off by not exactly getting directly into the show, but commenting on kind of why we're doing this. Because with the show's increasing popularity, I feel like, at least to me, and I I know you feel the same, that the worst possible outcome for the show would be that people don't do their own research and they don't come to their own conclusions. So when I I read the comments and it's like, oh, should I eat this or, or should I eat that or should I do this or that? And it breaks my heart sometimes because it's like, take this information for what you will, uh, please do self diagnostics, please get labs done, evaluate the information and apply it to your life that makes sense or completely reject it and go on to something different. But I, I, I guess we needed to make that disclaimer, at least for some people. How, how did how did you feel about that? Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I've, I've started noticing on the forum too, I mean, the, a lot of people joined uh, recently and I started getting a lot of personal messages saying, hey, here are my labs. Tell me what I, sh- what I should eat, what I should take. And I keep saying, you know, I mean, very often, most of the answers to what these people are looking for, at least as a start point, they're already contained, you know, somewhere in the forum in a thread. So I try to tell them, look, search for these keywords, you know, and see and, and look at the thread. You know, it's just it's not just the information that I provide you. First of all, it could be wrong. Right. At best, it's incomplete. It, it, I don't know your context, just like Ray says, everything's context. So you have to take it as a starting point and look what applies to you and what doesn't. And unfortunately, many times people just just kind of want to be, I guess, you know, for lack of time or because they're afraid that they, they don't understand it can be very overwhelming. Initially, they they, they kind of want to be just told very direct, specific steps that they can take so that they can feel better, right? I wish that it was that easy, right? Um, totally. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't seem to be that way. And I think there's a very good reason for that. I mean, I think ultimately health can only... It can improve by somebody else maybe telling you what to do, but I don't think it can be sustained that way. Just because, you know, the the, the, the recommendations that many people do, they're, they're always in isolation. It's always a snapshot in time. And and in order for health to continue to be maintained, it needs to be an ongoing activity. So, you know, I, I don't think it's feasible for everybody to be in touch with somebody else 24-7 and, and for them to be constantly being monitored and being told what to do. I guess that that's what modern medicine. That will be the the dream come true for modern medicine. You know, you basically paying a doctor around the clock to be monitoring you and looking at your data, and and I think that's what they're trying to do. But I don't think it, I don't I don't think it will be beneficial in the long run. It's just going to end up, um, you know, relinquishing a, a lot of a lot of the, the freedoms that your health depends on. I think Ray said that whenever somebody tells you to do something, it powerfully inactivates your own guidance guidance system that basically was honed over 4 billion years on this planet and, and maybe even before that. And things are going to change. So it's so important that a small investment is made to figure out kind of the basics of the, the physiology behind whatever problem the person is experiencing so they can confront those changes and then move in different directions. And we're like, we're not static. We're not the same all the time. Things are changing every second. So I thought that was an important dialogue that we should probably have. And I might add it to the intro in some capacity, but I just wanted to add that in there because I'm sure like you have been getting tons of messages and emails and slightly confused, but maybe the disclaimer was just warranted and we should have been doing that. So... Uh, without further ado, we should get into today's show on nitric oxide and methylene blue. And we talked about nitric oxide a little bit last time, and then Ray was interviewed twice about it on KMUD. And I consider those to be essential for understanding anything about nitric oxide because it's really confusing, as Georgie, I'm sure, will get into because 
this is another one of those things that is thought to be beneficial and that you want to increase your nitric oxide levels. And so it can be like estrogen, like serotonin, like the essential fatty acids. Nitric oxide is another thing to add to the list of uh, these so-called contradictions or paradoxes or, or what have you. So, uh, I mean, what, what, what are your general thoughts on the physiological view of nitric oxide compared to the mainstreams, Georgie? I think nitric oxide, uh, some of the views that, that mainstream medicine has on that are legitimate in that, that it's produced by the organism, both in health and in disease, and it does have a physiological role. Um, I think where, where modern medicine tends to go astray in the sense that it tries to elevate the levels of nitric oxide to, to a point where they become directly contributing to pathology. Nitric oxide, just like glycolysis, can be thought of, and, and it's, there's a good reason for this parallel, they actually mimic each other very well and, and they induce each other, so to speak. Nitric oxide can be thought of as an emergency substitute for carbon dioxide. So it's the primary um, endothelial, so-called endothelial-derived relaxing factor. In other words, when your body perceives a virtual state of hypoxia, the, there are cells that are lining your blood vessels that express the enzyme called nitric oxide synthase, and they'll synthesize nitric oxide from the amino acid arginine, which is one of the sources, or from dietary nitrates, that, which you ingest with food, such as protein and some vegetables, like beets. Basically, the, these cells will produce nitric oxide, and, and this is an emergency situation where, where, where your body does not have enough carbon dioxide to dilate the blood vessels, which is its preferred way. That's how it, it's usually done in a way that doesn't, doesn't contribute to pathology. And the way uh, the, the mechanism behind it is nitric oxide and carbon dioxide both regulate the amount of calcium in the cells. So the, rel the relaxation is basically getting the calcium out of the cell. And the correct way to do it is elevating the levels of carbon dioxide. But in an emergency situation where metabolism is not working properly, because as we know, proper levels of carbon dioxide cannot be maintained if oxidative phosphorylation is working well. It, in a situation where it is not, the, the body will elevate these le the levels of nitric oxide in order to sort of combat this perception of hypoxia, that the, basically the, the tissues are not getting enough blood flow. Uh, that's one reason, one reason, one physiological reason why the body would raise nitric oxide on its own. And Ray was saying this was a local attempt to co overcome the stress momentarily and that th the difference being the shift into the systemic production of nitric oxide as we age. Exactly. So just like the stress hormones, in a, basically in a short term, nitric oxide can be obviously beneficial because it prevents, it can temporarily prevent, in an emergency situation, it can prevent direct ischemia. In other words, the, the complete loss of oxygen to certain tissues like the heart or the brain. But when this becomes systemic, then the, the so-called general adaptation syndrome starts, which is a term Hans Selle coined. And what happens is that then this, uh, this biomarker of stress, which was supposed to be only raised you know, short term, now it's raised chronically. And then it directly, the body starts to adapt to it. And, and basically, in a state of chronic hypoxia, the body says, you know, okay, so nitric oxide is not enough. What else should I do in order to increase blood flow? Nitric oxide just so happens that chronic elevated is together with lactate. These are the two most powerful stimulators of angiogenesis. In other words, the formation of new blood vessels. Whenever we have, whenever we need a wound healed or I guess some kind of a trauma to be reversed, that may be a good thing, but chronically angiogenesis is one of the primary mechanisms between behind the development and the spread of cancer. All goes back to that growth state and differentiated state. Exactly, and and nitric oxide uh, also chronically elevated. The way it's the way it's it's being detoxified is primarily through through the uh, complex the, the electron transport chain complexes one and four. Um, and it just so happens that, that the, the enzyme cytochrome C oxidase, which is responsible, which is the, the primary driver behind the final steps of the oxidative phosphorylation, it binds irreversibly to nitric oxide. So in other words, if your levels of nitric oxide increase beyond a certain point, it will suffocate all of the enzymes that you have, all the cytochrome C oxidase enzymes. And by saying irreversibly, irreversible, this means that you will not be performing proper oxidative phosphorylation until new cytochrome C oxidases are produced, which, which sometimes can take days. So in other words, chronically elevated NO directly inhibits metabolism and contributes to, to, a, to a systemic hypoxia, which of course the body combats by increasing angiogenesis, which is essentially the, the, the cancer metabolism, the cancer, the cancer behavior. Some of the natural ways to lower nitric oxide are, are things like just restoring 
the electron flow and restoring the balance between NADH and NAD+. Uh, yeah, that's correct. I wanted to also mention another physiological reason NO may be elevated temporarily is in infections. In infections, whenever you have a viral or a bacterial infection, the body produces extra NO because it is toxic to living organisms. So this right there should tell you how good nitric oxide is for you. The body uses it to 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 kill other living forms, um, and as soon as that's done, the body quickly inactivates uh, NO. And basically, it converts it to harmless nitrites, and then you excrete it through your through your urine. But you know, if, whenever you have this this chronic elevation, it's it's a it's a biomarker of a, of a disease state. And some of the natural ways to do it is, if you don't want your NO to to rise to start with, just I guess don't get an infection. That's one thing. Not, we can always control that. And the second thing is, make sure that you try to to have optimal metabolism as as often as possible. Because you know, whenever the body again perceives perceives a functional deficiency of carbon dioxide, it will increase NO. So the primary way to keep NO down is. Make sure you're free of infections and make sure your metabolism works. And if that is not working for some reason, there are some natural factors which that, that you can do. Caffeine is known to lower the enzyme nitric oxide synthase. Niacinamide is known to lower that enzyme. Zinc is known to lower that enzyme. Magnesium is known to get nitric oxide out of the cell and prepare it for excretion. Uh, so in other words, in a state of magnesium deficiency, you will have trouble deactivating nitric oxide inside the cell. So you get a nitric oxide overload. Some other things, I mentioned CO2. And of course, uh, lysine is another one. It tends to oppose the amino acid arginine, which is the precursor uh, to nitric oxide. So you can see why ingesting large amounts of arginine may not be that, that good for you. So lysine is an, is, a, is an amino acid that inhibits nitric oxide synthase. And perhaps the primary compound that is becoming really fashionable these days, I hate the word, but that's that's what it could. It, it seems to be lately is uh, the the dye called metal in blue. What are some like the, of the problems associated with higher levels of nitric oxide? Like how would there be any way to measure that or to know that that was an issue for for a certain person? Uh, yeah, you can actually you can buy nitric oxide test strips. They test nitric oxide in saliva. They're, they're very cheap. They're, they're, they're sold without prescription. You can buy them from Amazon. I actually have them at home. And they're really good for telling you where you, what the level of nitric oxide is. It's been, they're actually approved by the FDA in the sense that they're effective in showing you, you know, a good correlation between blood levels of nitric oxide and your saliva. So if you buy these test strips, they're relatively cheap. I think they cost only $5 for about 100 of them. And you, can only, you, you probably only need to test it most once a day. Um, you get an idea of, of where you stand on nitric oxide. And I've used them to basically monitor the effectiveness of various compounds that I've been testing, like caffeine and niacinamide and methylene blue. Um, and of those, I have to say ca- caffeine and methylene blue are probably the most effective. And we talked about digestive problems last week and mentioned that nitric oxide is increased by serotonin, endotoxin, and estrogen. So it's like part of that huge, like problematic substances that increase as you get older and you pointed to a paper that you found what what was it called the nitric oxide theory of aging that's right it's basically it's called the nitric oxide theory of aging and the authors basically um look through some of the major pathological clusters that that modern medicine deals with you know including cardiovascular disease neurodegenerative diseases um, all the all of the bowel syndromes, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, cancer. So a lot of the cancers that, that, that I think they only mentioned the, the some of the bowel cancers, liver cancer, and the endometrial cancers. But they, they also made the argument that the, the the mechanism is so generic behind the anal pathology that they expect it to be valid in, in almost all cancers. So basically, they said. Whenever we look at, at any kind of a disease currently known to man, especially chronic disease, we always we always notice elevated levels of NO. And initially, they may be there just you know as a as you know as a, as a signal that something is going wrong, something is not working right. But but with time, they actually become direct contributors to pathology. And they list some of the recent trials in Germany where they're giving people with terminal stage cancer. Uh, pretty much any cancer. I think they're, they're recruited people with pancreatic, lung cancer, neuroglioblastomas. All of these are deadly cancers. Basically, these people have a life expectancy of no more than a few months. And they're giving him a, a, an amino acid which acts as an antagonist to the amino acid arginine. And its effects, of course, is lowering the levels of nitric oxide synthesis in the body. And I think the trial has been running for about a year and a half now. All of the people are still alive. Wow. Uh, I can send you that. Basically, the study is still ongoing. 
Um, the and the compound's name is 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 L dash name, uh, L dash N A M E, and it stands for L nitro arginine methyl something else. But basically, it's a it's a synthetic com compound that happens to act as an antagonist of the amino acid arginine. But there are other compounds which we mentioned that that act very similarly. Caffeine is a good one, and methylene blue is probably the most well known. And those compounds are acting by activating cytochrome. Red light is another thing, and those compounds are acting by activating cytochrome C oxidase. Yeah. So, so basically, the way nitric oxide is typically inactivated is by binding with with cytochrome C oxidase irreversibly, and and generating a nitrite compound, which then gets excreted. So, because the binding is irreversible. Basically, the only for a long time, people felt that there's no other way to to get basically to re, to recover the metabolism other than producing new cytochrome C oxidase. But then they found that there there are two agents, two two approaches that actually can get the NO disassociated from cytochrome C oxidase. And one such agent is is red light, and which directly breaks the bond between cytochrome C oxidase and nitric oxide. And the second one is is methylene blue. So methylene blue inhibits new synthesis of nitric oxide. And because it, it it can act as a as a, an alternative oxidator, like 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 uh, oxidant like oxygen, as an and as an alternative electron acceptor, it can actually directly inactivate even free floating NO. So it does three things: it can dissociate NO from cytochrome C oxidase and inhibits the production of new AO, new NO, and also scavenges the the free floating NO which is in your blood. And I think Ray mentioned this, and then I poked around on PubMed and meant said that nitric oxide could lower the core temperature. And I think in an email to somebody who wasn't responding to thyroid, he mentioned, oh, nitric oxide can do that. And methylene blue, at least for, I haven't used it extensively, but what I did notice was that it just like almost immediately just really increases the temperature, like to where you're just sweating. And I thought that was an interesting observation. In addition, you posted things saying that it lowered estrogen and prolactin. Seems like a incredibly interesting compound, at least for diagnostics to kind of see what's going on. I guess the main reason why it's so useful is because it acts like uh, it can act as a substitute to oxygen. In other words, as the final electron acceptor in the entire metabolic chain. So whenever you have cases of hypoxia, which now we're finding that virtually every disease can be characterized as a chronic hypoxic state. In other words, metabolism is not working well. Oxygen is not getting to the cells. They're not properly oxygenated. They're in a chronic state of hypoxia. Glycolysis is upregulated. There's too much NADH being produced. The state is in the cell is in a reduced state, and all this is because of of inability of oxygen to do its good by extracting these electrons and basically reoxidizing the NADH back to NAD. Well, it looks like well, not looks like, but it's been proven that methylene blue can do the same. In other words, if you have too much glycolysis, let's say in a cancer cell, and you're producing too much NADH, the way the body gets rid of it is by using pyruvate to oxidize NADH and in the process create lactate. Well, if you if you take methylene blue, you'll actually substitute for pyruvate, and you'll you'll basically you'll avoid this creation of extra lactate. So it has been shown that met, taking some methylene blue lowers the levels of the enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase, which is overexpressed in every single type of cancer. If you go on Google and go to the Wikipedia page of lactate dehydrogenase, you will see modern medicine likes to call it a non-specific biomarker, both for diagnosis. Uh, but that's what makes it so powerful. Whenever you hear non-specific, means something something is good is going on. It, it is a non-specific biomarker both for diagnosing cancer and for prognosis. In other words, how long these people will live? Just go. It's it's incredible. Like basically, right now, three pharmaceutical companies are doing everything possible to come up with an LDH inhibitor when several of them naturally already exist. Methylene blue is one of them. And LDH is tested on just like basic lab tests. Should that? Do you have any opinion on what that number should be around? Um, basically, because it's an it's an intracellular enzyme, there shouldn't be much of it floating around in the blood. And whenever there is a, a lot of it flo floating around in the blood, there's only a few reasons for it to be there. You either have some kind of a, a liver damage or chronic necrotic state going on somewhere. And because cancer cells are known to have a, a large rate of renewal, they're the ones who dump a lot of LDH in the blood. Um, and I think the upper limit, depending on the lab who tests, it's, it's up to 235 units per liter. So it's it's a very small number. Um, so basically, um, if you do that, the blood test, most doctors may be against it as an initial uh, biomarker. But I, I found that it's incredibly helpful in determining if somebody is in a is in a good good health or poor. Um, if LADH is high, 
you're probably not healthy. I'm not saying it's indicative necessarily of cancer, but if you look at the studies, especially the ones that are referenced by the Wikipedia page, you'll find that there has not been a single case of cancer so far that had low levels of LDH in the blood. Interesting. I didn't know that. So starting with nutrition and then getting more complicated with thyroid, progesterone, caffeine, then somebody could explore methylene blue and also aspirin reduces nitric oxide too, right? Yeah, aspirin, aspirin inhibits nitric oxide synthase, which is the enzyme that produces it. So if you already have too much nitric oxide, I guess the really the only way to get rid of it is either doing red light or you know ingesting methylene blue, the only two things that are known to disassociate it from cytochrome C oxidase other than waiting for you know for new one enzymes to be produced. But um, um, basically, if you're taking thyroid and your temperatures are not going up, um, I agree with Ray, and he said that basically there is either a vitamin A deficiency because it's so important, for, uh, vitamin A and vitamin D actually, they're, they're very important for proper thyroid function, for the cells to actually uptake in the thyroid hormone and responding to it, or there is a chronic infection going on somewhere. And because NO is overproduced in chronic infective states, the overproduction of NO is, what, is what's preventing your temperature from going up. It's because metabolism is not working. Well. It's binding all of these cytochrome Z oxidases. But if you're taking thyroid and you're not reacting to it, I would do a blood test for vitamin A and vitamin D. And also, probably not a bad idea to do a full blood count, CBC, just to see where your white blood cells are. If they're high, it's chances are you, you have some kind of a latent infection somewhere. You think the blood, the vitamin A blood test is a good test for vitamin I know there's lots of controversy about vitamins in the blood. Um, yeah, but it, it's not the best one. Ideally, there is a company, I think they're, they're based out of the Netherlands. They're actually coming up with a medical device that will use electromagnetic waves to measure concentrations of the fat-soluble vitamins directly in your liver. Which is where, yeah, exact. That's that's where it matters, right? Because that the liver is the major storage of all the fat soluble vitamins. That's why Ray Ray recommends eating liver, you know, once a week or you know, one once every two weeks. You eat like uh, three, four, five ounces of liver. But that 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 is that is the ultimate way. You care about tissues, tissue levels of vitamin uh, of the fat soluble vitamins. But if you have high levels um, of the fat soluble vitamins in the blood, chances are the levels in, in the liver are also high because the liver usually. Is conservative about releasing these hormones into the into the blood, and it usually does so in only two cases: perceives there is a tissue deficiency somewhere, or it has too much, and it's it's dumping the rest into the blood, um, basically to try to get rid of it. It seems like low thyroid is so common, and thyroid is needed to use vitamin A properly, and and vitamin A deficiency is almost equally as common. I know Ray has said that. He thought that dandruff was a common sign of vitamin A deficiency. Is there anything, because I know you've done lots of really excellent work on vitamin A. Is there any any other deficiency symptoms to look out for? Uh, if you're deficient in vitamin A, none of your steroid production will be optimal. Uh, you will, If you're a male, you will almost always be testosterone deficient. Well, I don't know if that's such a word, you know, but but your testosterone will be suboptimal, testosterone levels. DHT will be suboptimal. Progesterone will be suboptimal. In other words, by, by, by the way, vitamin A and, and progesterone, are they're so close in terms of activity in the tissues that back in the day, uh, in the early 1930s and, and up until the mid-1940s, vitamin A was used as a progesterone surrogate. Um, and even to this day, you can go and pub and look at some studies. Basically, I just I post some studies on the forum as well. So they found out in vivo, and I think it was a rat model that uh, a decent dose of vitamin A acted almost directly like progesterone. I think it even it even binded to the receptors, quote unquote, because you know well, not many people believe in those anymore. But vitamin A is anti-estrogenic by both inhibiting aromatase and binding and antagonizing the estrogen receptor, which is what progesterone is known to do. It's known to do both. So if you're vitamin A deficient, your your steroid your steroid enzyme, enzymes three beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase and seventeen beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which is the two enzymes that catalyze the conversion of pregnenolone to DHEA and pregnenolone to progesterone. So it means you'll be stuck at the pregnenolone at the pregnenolone step. None of the other steroids further down the chain will be working well. So you will probably be feel you probably feel fatigued. If you're male, your muscles will feel soft, you, you feel out of shape, uh, you, you, you won't be able to sleep well, uh, metabolism obviously won't be working. I mean, proper metabolism depends not just on thyroid hormone, it depends on low levels of, of estrogen in the cell and preferably higher levels of progesterone and DHEA. And if, when vitamin A deficiency, you will not have enough production of these. I can attest, at least anecdotally, that vitamin A for sleep is, is 
huge, I think. I was taking vitamin D for way too much for a long time. And one of the things I noticed was just like, it was impossible to sleep. So make sure you're not taking vitamin D at the expense of vitamin A. And sometimes even liver might not be enough depending on the situation. So looking at all the variables, I think is good. I do agree. And unfortunately, uh, modern medicine has done a very good job of scaring people away from taking uh, the natural vitamin A that is available. I shouldn't call it natural, but basically you can buy uh, the actual retinol, which is the, the natural form that exists in the body, and then which, get, which then gets converted to the active retinoic acid. Or you can buy one of its esters, retinyl palmitate or retinyl acetate. Basically, I think the official RDA recommendation is no more than 5,000 units of either retinol or, or the retinol equivalents like the palmitate and the acetate. And that is a that is a puny dose. Um, yeah, if you actually have properly properly functional thyroid, I think the estimate, and I've confirmed this by looking at all of the animal models that have that have, that have worked with supplemental vitamin A uh, so far, and when you convert the dose to a human dose, uh, when they feed the animals the so-called normal diet, the one that contains normal vitamin uh, normal levels of vitamin, in other words, to prevent deficiency, the the human equivalent dose is always upwards of twenty thousand international units per day and the, the the toxicity symptoms in animals and it's been tested in humans as well they don't start to manifest until you reach the hundreds of thousands of units taken for at least six months there was a, a recent clinical trial with humans with uh, natural vitamin a for acne and they basically concluded two things number one in order for for the natural vitamin a's to be effective uh, males Females needed between 200,000 and 300,000 units per day for at least three months. Males between 400 and 500,000 international units per day for six months. And none of them had any signs of, of toxicity. I think they tested liver enzymes. The only sign that uh, some people had was, was slight nausea. So the study concluded by saying, unfortunately, this safe and effective vitamin has been demonized unnecessarily. So there you have it. But then on the other hand, doctors have no problem recommending tretinoin, which is known to uh, to turn fetuses into uh, into abominations, and they're recommending it in hundreds of milligrams per day. You know, including in the, including to pregnant women. Is, is that so, accurate? Uh, it, there are several forms of it. I think yeah, I think uh, it, there's tretinoin and isotretinoin. One of them is Accutane. I don't know exactly which one, but yes. So it's it's a it's a it's a patented version of vitamin A, which is known to be toxic. And I think a lot of the a lot of the fears about vitamin A came from that, forgetting that just like in the progesterone case, so the pharma industry came up with a lot of these synthetic progestogens, pro- progestins. I'm sorry, and they they said, oh, it lo- it works just like progesterone. No, it doesn't. Uh, so basically, it has in the best case they have only about ten to fifteen percent of the of the progesteronic activity of of true progesterone. Second, they were found to bind to other receptors unlike progesterone. And finally, I actually because uh, some some people in the forum are complaining about excessive cortisol and everybody's afraid of progesterone because it's the precursor and it's going to raise their cortisol. And I looked and and there's some there's some cases of synthetic progesterones raising the levels of cortisol and, co- and causing the so-called Cushing syndrome. But they specifically said natural progesterone was ineffective in causing Cushing syndrome. Not only that, it actually cured it. <laughs> so whenever you hear about a, a synthetic drug, an equi- a so-called equivalent of a natural one, I strongly recommend doing your own research and challenging your doctor to answer questions about toxicity and why exactly is the synthetic version better than the one, uh, or by better means safer than the one available um, from Mother Nature. I don't want to sound like I'm recommending the natural route, but you should be questioning the synthetic route too. Uh, you should be questioning both. There needs to be good rationale why you're putting something inside your body. So making sure adequate thyroid function, making sure your hands and feet are warm and your pulse is relatively high, making sure you're getting enough vitamin A, taking progesterone if necessary, exploring caffeine and remembering that the clearance of caffeine could be a diagnostic for liver health and aspirin. What, do you have any opinions on the dose of aspirin or methylene blue to lower the amount of nitric oxide? So in in order for, for methylene blue to scavenge the, already, the, the free-floating nitric oxide, um, I think Ray said anywhere between 1 and 2 milligrams per day is probably plenty. And then depending on, on, on what specific condition, of course, I'm not going to say it's effective, but the conditions that methylene blue has been studied for or is currently being studied for in humans, such as Alzheimer's disease, bipolar depression, and even cancer, 
they seem to require oral doses anywhere between 15 to 60 milligrams, 60 milligrams per day in divided doses. And I think in those doses, actually, the methylene blue inhibits, starts inhibiting nitric oxide synthase, so it will inhibit the production of new nitric oxide. And by the way, when you take methylene blue, if you sit under red light, you're, you're getting an additive effect. It is so potent that right now, one pharmaceutical company, I believe it's AstraZeneca, is applying to the FDA in order to approve a combination of methylene blue and uh, infrared light for the treatment of, I think, final stage four melanoma. Yeah, in other words, you ingest, you know, I, I, I don't know if they're using generic methylene blue. I think it's one of the patented versions, but it's basically, it converts to, it's a prod drug from methylene blue. It converts to methylene blue in the body. And then you sit under red light for about an hour and the combination of met the methylene blue and the red light essentially recover your metabolism. I have to look at the exact application. I want to see how they dance around carefully around the fact of what are they going to say that cancer is a metabolic disease and such is treatable <laughs> by these met methods or how exactly they explain it because to the best of my knowledge, yeah, I have not seen any gene or any receptor <laughs> that explains methylene blue's activity other than it's, uh, you know, other than its metabolic effects. So I want to see how exactly they're explaining the the, the, eff the proposed efficacy of their drug. Uh, because if it's not genes and if it's not receptors, then it's got to be metabolic. So it'll be interesting to see. And you mentioned too that you could apply methylene blue to the skin and, and use it topically. Almost every compound, if it sits on the skin long enough, it will absorb. It has been tested with the so-called water-soluble vitamins, like the uh, vitamin C and the B vitamins. And basically within, I think within within an hour, 80% of the vitamin was absorbed, regardless of what it was dissolved in water, ethanol, uh, methanol, or, or, or even DMSO. I think DMSO actually achieved almost 100% within the first hour. But most of the vitamins got at least 80% absorbed within the first hour, and then the rest got slowly absorbed over the next 20 23 hours. So within 20, 24 hours, almost the entire vitamin was recovered in urine, which means it was it was uh, perfectly fine, accepted, uh, absorbed through the skin. The same tests have been done with amino acids. As a matter of fact, that the question came up on the forum just today. People are asking if they can apply um, the amino acid taurine on the skin because um, I posted some studies showing that taurine is more effective than the the hair loss drug finasteride. I saw that for hair loss. Yeah, so people were very excited about that. They said, "Oh, you know what? You know, can we apply taurine? Would it be absorbed?" And uh, I'm about to post some studies that show that 92% of it is absorbed within the first hour after being applied directly to the skin. So, so again, you know, the the whole theory about the cell needing specific receptors for something to be active or to get through it. It's just, it doesn't seem to be true how are these things getting in there. They're, they're squeezing in be between the cells. Yeah, I, I, I think you can apply methylene blue as, as well as other compounds like aspirin, niacinamide. As a matter of fact, some countries have, uh, have drugs that are used for skin rejuvenation and for treating, treatment of surgical scars, and they consist of aspirin and niacinamide. 4% solution of niacinamide and 1% solution of aspirin in water. And they've been approved as, as effective as a topical for, as topical administration. Methylene blue is no different. It gets in, through your skin just fine. And it can be used to actually uh, judge the health of the local tissue. As a matter of fact, in the 1940s and the 1950s, it was called as the methylene blue redox test. And you can use it to test you know, whether, whether a certain food is spoiled. You can pour, put some drops in the milk, right? And the more oxygen in the milk meaning the basically the slower methylene blue is going to decolorize so this tells you you know whether the milk is spoiled or not and the same thing for your skin when you when you put some drops of methylene blue in your skin the quicker they disappear means the more hypoxic the local tissue is means the more oxygen it needs and since methylene blue substitutes for oxygen the the, the quicker it gets used that's super interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, so uh, you can try it like people that have uh, like hair falling off or they have like a scar somewhere or, or a place where basically the skin looks bluish. Try to put some methylene blue there, see how quickly it disappears. Within an hour, it's gone. Oh, I, I need to measure specific numbers. The tests show that disappearance uh, faster than six hours in, indicates local tissue pathology. So you, you want the methylene blue, at least some of it, to stay for longer than six hours. So some people have reported you know, staying for days. So that's, that's fine. But if it, if it is, disappears faster than six hours, means there's there's local hypoxia. Since we mentioned it, I just want to get your take because it's so controversial. Uh, I know minocycline can, and probably other tetracyclines can lower nitric oxide. Is there any dose that that's effective for that? I've looked at the effects of all the, all of the tetracyclines mostly on cancer and lowering estrogen. I just happen to be very closely related, obviously. 
Um, and it seems like the therapeutic dose that is in which these these drugs are sold, I think for minocycline, tetracycline, and doxycycline, it all starts at like 100 milligrams per pill. Most of the animal studies that I have seen and most of the human ones that I've seen show that this is enough uh, even for cancer treatment. So I'm assuming that I didn't see any direct study for in vivo study for lowering nitric oxide, but since nitric oxide is is uh, so tightly correlated with the development and the progression of cancer, I'm assuming that because these drugs were so effective, at least in the studies, that they're probably lowering nitric oxide even at the doses that are being sold as an antibacterial activity. Now there is a study that showed that lower dose of tetracyclines may be effective as low, well, especially for lowering estrogen. So if you take there's a there is a human study with osteoporotic women. They were taking 20 milligrams tetracycline twice a day for a total of 40 milligrams. And they, they were taking it for six months and it fully reversed their symptoms of osteoporosis. And I think one of the uh, one of the one of the biomarkers that they looked at, I think, was exhaled nitric oxide that also went down. A single dose of 200 milligrams of caffeine reduced exhaled nitric oxide by 40% in people with asthma. And since, you know, exhaled nitric oxide is, is used as one of the as primary tests for, for determining how bad your asthma is, you can see whether that, that gas is really good for you or not. Um, another, another recent news in terms of nitric oxide is many people probably know the drugs, the, uh, the anti-erectile dysfunction drugs, which I find it funny that I call it that way because ultimately they will actually give you erectile dysfunction. Yeah, and actually, I mean, a, a known, and they, it's all claimed that it's a rare side effect. It's called priapism, and it's a very painful thing, basically. You, you maintain a permanent erection as a result of this drug to the point where you basically, the, 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 the blood supply coming out of the penis is disturbed, and you get basically the, the, the tissue suffocates, and you get gangrene of the penis, and you can get it from Viagra. So it can cause you something that, you know, it's meant to treat almost in a, in, a, in a much worse situation. But anyways, aside from that, Viagra was recently shown to dramatically increase the risk of skin cancer and especially, especially deadly and highly re drug resistant melanoma. So think about that the next time somebody tells you that uh, Viagra is a safe drug to take. Before we close, was there anything that we glossed over that you wanted to talk about nitric oxide? I would say that basically I, I think one of the best ways to um, non-invasively assess your nitric oxide status is you can uh, you can search for a device called capnometer. It basically measures your the exhaled level of carbon dioxide. Um, so you can I guess you can buy the strips just like I mentioned. But the true test of health is not necessarily the lack of nitric oxide. It's how much carbon dioxide you're producing. And this this capnometer you exhale in it and it will tell you how much you are how much carbon dioxide you're producing. There's only one or two conditions, and there seem to be genetic one of the few few truly genetic conditions, where people produce too much carbon dioxide and um, they get they get a a, a, a a specific disease of the bones. I think it's called hyper Patron petrosis, yeah, petrosis, some kind of petrosis. Yeah, so basically their spine discs fuse because of too much carbon dioxide because it's so good for the bones. They become so powerful and they almost fuse together. So these people get paralyzed. Yeah, like marble but they, you know, disease or something. Exactly, exactly. So that, those are the only few cases where, you know, excessive production of carbon dioxide occurs and you don't want it. For the vast majority of people, this will not be the case. And how much carbon dioxide you exhale is, a, is probably the, the, the cardinal measurement of health. Anything going on in your body, really. And anything that decreases, any any sign of decrease of carbon dioxide indicates metabolism is not working, and all the all the diseases that come from that, and we're finding that almost all of them do come from that, are associated and with that. What, what about the blood level of CO two or bicarbonate on the labs? You can use that. It's not a bad surrogate, but depending on some people that have a metabolic or respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, they can have readings that can you know that they can be misleading. For example, some people can have high bicarbonate levels, right? But they're there because, not because carbon dioxide is high, it's uh, basically to buffer extreme acidity come, coming from somewhere else. So you can have high bicarbonate levels. The way it's really measured, I think it's, uh, it's called partial, partial carbon dioxide pressure. And it's, it's basically, it's, it's a catheter inserted directly into, into your artery. And, and it measures basically the, how much carbon dioxide is there. That, that is the true measure of carbon dioxide in your body. Not necessarily the bicarbonate levels, but it, it's it's a decent surrogate. Ultimately, the actually the breath level, if you get the capnometer, is more reliable because it tells you directly how much the carbon dioxide you're producing. If you look, if your lungs are working fine and you don't have diseases like cystic fibrosis, 
that test is more reliable than the bicarbonate test in the blood. And if you had a high prolactin test in combination with a high TSH and you were cold or at a low temperature and a low pulse rate, you could assume pretty much that you had low carbon dioxide output. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and another probably, uh, it's not a medical test, but if you do, ba- if you do back breathing like, uh, like Ray recommends, if you produce enough carbon dioxide, you'll start feeling the effects after only uh, a few breaths. Within 30 seconds of breathing into the same bag, you start feeling like it's, I don't want to call it suffocating feeling, but it's, it's uncomfortable, right? Because carbon dioxide starts to build up in your body. Try to run for a few minutes and then breathe into their bag. You, you may be able to breathe in and out from the same bag for about 10 minutes and nothing will change. That's, it's a sign you hyperventilated to the point where you're producing almost, you have retained almost no carbon dioxide. So you, you, can, you can inhale and exhale a lot of oxygen <laughs> and basically, you know, metabolism is not working. That's, that's a, I guess, the cheapest and, you know, fairly reliable way of, of calculating how much carbon dioxide you're producing. And what about breathing through your nose? I know it's really difficult for a lot of people to do that. My friend Adam Cap, I think he posted a few articles on nose breathing and carbon dioxide. And I know at least when I was really sick, I couldn't breathe through my nose at all. And it doesn't seem to be an issue now. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you, if you have stuffy nose and it's not an infection, it is definitely low carbon dioxide. Um, one of the quickest ways to get your nose unstuffed is to hold your breath, grab your nose with, with two fingers, like I'm doing right there with the microphone and, and tilt your head left to right five times each, each side. Um, and then basically not breathe while you're doing that. So basically how carbon dioxide will build up in most people, unless you're really hypothyroid, I mean, then you not, won't produce much. And then once you, you let go of your nose, it should be the, like the, the, the sinuses and, and, and the actual nostrils should open up, um, even if you had a lot of mucus before that. It shows you how, how endothelially relaxing carbon dioxide is. That's what you want to relax your arteries and your breathing tubes, not, not, not nitric oxide, which is the emergency solution. There's a video of that, so I'll attach it to the show notes. Georgie, thank you so much for talking with me today. Where can we find more of your work on the internet this week? I post very avidly on the Repeat Forum. The website is www.repeatforum.com. Um, I also try to respond by email. I've been getting a lot of emails lately. So far, I'm responding to all of them. If I just happen to not respond to yours, feel free to bug me. My email is h-a-i-d-u-t at gmail.com. And I do happen to have some supplements if you're interested in those. The website is www.idealabsdc.com. Idealabsdc is one word. And a lot of the questions that you may have may already be answered on the forum. So before sending me an email with a specific question about your condition, please do search. It achieves two things, several things actually. Number one, it will, it will get you into the habit of taking care of your own health and not relying on anybody other than the internet, you know, to get information. Number two, it, it will prevent both you and me from the almost inevitable quasi-legal situation where we're going to be discussing things over email that are, do relate to specific conditions. And I do try to tell you what, you know, what you may want to try and talk to your doctor about and things like that. And you may come back and say, well, I'm not seeing a doctor and I'll keep saying talk to your doctor. So in order to avoid this situation, many of these things are already public information. You should be able to find them. Try to exhaust these these resources first before contacting me. And the final benefit is by posting to the forum, many people get to see your situation. Many of them have similar, if not the same, complaints as you do. And they may respond with suggestions. They will benefit from your from the answers that you get from other people. So that's the whole purpose of the forum. If this was just a one-on-one thing, that would be, you know, there's no point. You know, the, the the larger community does not benefit. I think the ultimate goal is to help as many people as possible with as little resources as possible. Not to mention going to raypeat.com and just using the search box. Like I can't even tell you how many questions I've had where I didn't just send Ray an email. I, I went to his website, typed, typed in a phrase with quotation marks, and then tried to understand maybe his orientation about something. And there also is a resource called Raypeat Email Exchanges, which I'm not sure how many people are aware of, but it's linked on the Raypeat forum. And it is, in my opinion, one of the best resources imaginable because it's just Ray's replies to certain questions and for somebody that's like coming into this kind of interested seems crazy i think that's a great place to start because it's not really intimidating and ray's just answering questions 
that he's been receiving for years and you can read all of them and it kind of starts painting a picture of what he's talking about. At least it really helped me when I started and I actually helped put some of it together. So there's that to look into. Georgie, thank you so much. You're awesome. I appreciate it. And I'll talk to you next week. Thanks a lot, Danny. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to talking to you again. That's going to conclude this week's episode. I'd like to thank Georgie again for talking with me today, along with my patrons for making this content possible. Next week, we're going to talk about evolution, genetic determinism, and cancer. So look forward to that and leave all your comments and criticisms in the comment section. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, hit that like button and that supports the show as well. So thanks again for listening and I'll talk to you guys soon.